Our dean will probably be joining us today. So in any given any given time, uh, Mr. Sida, if he, um, Dr. Werner joins us, just stop me and we will give her the space. Sounds good. Thank you. So welcome everyone. Uh, tonight's topic, it's um it's actually part, it's a topic that is part of a a series of webinars that are gonna be happening this year, um, including a spring and fall uh, semester. And these um, uh, topics are actually within uh, uh, oh, what, what is considered within the, um, the cultural aspect of the work that we do in human services, meaning that um, we will be talking about diversity and how uh, our very own otherness, and we will talk about that word in a minute. Um, it's a, an element that uh, formulates who we are and indeed allows to interact with others in a very specific way. Um, if I dare myself to say it in a way where your essence gets in touch with other people's essence. And it's so important for us as a human service providers that to understand that whoever you are and all the composition that is behind you, including your ethnicity, your experiences, whether they, those experiences are traumatic or not, your experiences um, during childhood, your family dynamic, your family values, your very own values as you continue growing, do play an important role in the way we serve others. Um, more than uh, more often than not, we receive the the sign of that uh, we need to suspend our beliefs and our values in order to help others, so that we can become, in a way, a tabula rasa, totally clean without anything. It, this is what we call in in philosophy an apogee. You suspend your knowledge of priority, which includes your totality, as a matter of fact, in order to to allow the other to manifest, to allow the other individuals um, to share who they are. Um, I, as an opposition to many of my colleagues, believe that suspending everything of who you are is an impossible task. Um, I, I don't believe that um, uh, that can be doable. What I do believe, however, is that as we continue in this field, as you continue to go into grad school or becoming actually a, a clinical counselor, or psychology or social worker, whatever you are going to do in your master's degree as you continue, one of the key elements is to continuously work on yourself to understand who you are. Um, so as opposed to believe suspending everything from who you are, I believe in understanding that totality so that you know when that kicks in, in the moment of serving others. Um, this is so important because this is from where bias start evolving. So when you begin understanding who you are and where you're coming from, including, like I said, your experiences, values, belief, your transgeneration, transgenerational transmission of values and all that, what happens is that you become more aware of your own bias when serving individuals out in the community. So that in and of itself begins providing us with an opportunity to actually work in ourselves and be very attentive to that. This is just a panoramic introduction of, of what we are going to be covering today. Um, my otherness as an, in, as a, as an entity, as a, uh, as a, a unique um, way of being in the world, it's always manifested when you are serving others. So politically speaking, um, I guess I, I'm going to start with that. So Dr. Wentz, um, that was a great introduction. Uh, can you pause for a second? I think the Dean of Health Sciences, Stacey sure. Warner, uh, just popped on, so I'm going to give her an opportunity to introduce herself um, Absolutely. to our students. <laughs> Hi, good evening, Stacy. If you're on, can you you can go ahead and unmute yourself or hi, I'm here. I'm trying to share my video, but it's not letting me. Uh I think that's because Gerardo's back. That's fine. Okay. If you got Hello. one, I can hold, hold on, go ahead. Try try now. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Stacey Warner. I am the new Dean of Health Sciences and Human Services. Um, my background. I, my background is nursing. I've taught nursing at GBC for the past 10, 10 years, and now I've moved into the dean role. Um, so I'm excited 
to see all of you on um, the symposium today. I just want to let you know that I have an open door policy. Um, virtually, my office is located in Winnemucca, if any of you live in the Winnemucca area. Um, but I also have an open door policy virtually. Um, if you'd like to meet with me, you can reach out to our administrative assistant, Elizabeth Stanley, and she can schedule an appointment um, with me. So I'm here to support or answer any questions. And yeah, I'm glad to join your symposium tonight. Thank you, Stacey. So um, as many of you may know that uh, Dr. Ambrinelli was our previous dean and she has accepted a role uh, to move on as <clears throat> vice president, but now she is serving as interim president of GBC. So that's really great for, mm -hmm. for her and her professional development, but also for us because she has a soft spot for health sciences. So that will um, undoubtedly lead to some exciting changes. And as Stacy takes the helm in health sciences, we'll have some kind of fresh blood in there with new ideas. And we're all looking forward to working with Stacy. So I'm really grateful. This is the first time we've had a Dean uh, in our symposium. So uh, we're glad that you made the effort to join us and um, I hope you enjoy or if you have time to stay for as much as you can, uh, yeah. you're busy, but. Is there anything else specifically you'd like to let students know? Um, um, trying to think. You're entering a great field. I'm glad you're here. So yeah, we really need you. We need, really, really need mental health um, providers. So I'm excited to see so many of you on. Great. Dr. Wentz, um, please continue. <laughs> Oops, my bad. Let me. So sorry. I, I, yeah. To to, this computer is new, so I don't even know what I'm clicking. So thank you for 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 uh, being there with me. So I was sharing with everyone before I mute myself and stop my video that uh, the term modernist um has been a term that has been used actually in the literature, whether it's psychology and counseling as a term that um, indicates or, or, or allows to communicate the professional people how other groups had been indeed suppressed by um, um, majority groups. Uh, so in this instance of this symposium, I'm utilizing this term, my otherness, not as a way of thinking um, thinking about us as minorities or the individuals they had been oppressed, which could be, but instead um, an, an invitation to begin understanding who you are and what you are bringing in when you are serving others, when you enter the relationship of helping others. So uh, I go into a more, if he, I may use the term philosophical and romanticized way of looking your very own in, into your very own identity. So, uh, so, so, so that everyone knows, so you may find the term used very differently out there in case you, you search it or, or you do a Google search, it will come into a, I guess, um, um, a power and control type of definition. So, but what is otherness? Um, when you when you start thinking actually the word otherness, what is interesting is that it begins actually describing a noun. And 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 as you probably know me for other symposium, I'm um, I'm in love with the language and its function. And when we think about a noun, we think about an individual, an idea, or even a thought, right? So, meaning that in and of itself uh, appears that we don't have action because we are not a verb or otherness is not a verb. Um, so when we start thinking about you as an individual and everything that you possess, in, including your qualities, your belief system, even your biases, and, 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 and of course the intersectionality, all the elements that compose you, including your gender, your, 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 um, uh, um, your social economic status, everything comes together to create you. And this interaction um, becomes your I. 
And when we start thinking about our I, we be, in order to manifest us, the other also needs to exist. Why do I say that? Because truly, without us having the other, we will not exist. Think for a minute. I'm giving you this example. If he, um, you were not a student, would I be a professor? Or even more. If you were not a, um, a son, a daughter, a, a father, or, or, or brother, or sister, who will be there? Would you have a mother, a dad? So when we start understanding, when we begin understanding the term otherness, we always do it in a liquefied manner. I am because the other is also who he, she, they are. So the otherness in and of itself and as paradoxically as it may sound, includes, without any doubt, the other. So I begin defining myself. So if, just to kind of um, <clears throat> expound on that, Gerardo, so to know yourself, we have to know others. And through the knowing of our others, we understand our otherness. Is that Correct. accurate? It is kind of a, I am trying to avoid, and uh, Morena had a beautiful saying, oh, we need to construct to illuminate what we are, and more of what we are, what constitute who we are, those elements. So I am trying to avoid the word uh, comparison, just because we don't live in a constant state of being where I need to compare myself in order to exist. And indeed, in early ages, such as um, childhood and even in actually more, more profoundly during adolescenthood, what we see is that young adolescents begin actually comparing themselves in order to understand who they are and what they like or what they don't like. But in that moment in life, and that, that is a stage of development, what we find is that the adolescents are actually developing cognitively as well. Meaning what? That there is not a lot of content there yet that can be processed, or even more, that their complexity to think about who they are is not, not there. Namely, a reflective skill where they can say, well, I like this and I like that because I am just this way. Instead, I have to begin trying out everything around me as an adolescent. Mm -hmm. So this which, goes, might, which might be an artifact of what we perceive as being rebellious, right? Correct. And, and thank you for bringing that up because oftentimes when we begin working with adolescents, we want them to do whatever we want and without considering that it is actually a term. Uh, a, a tormentous process for adolescents to figure it out who they are. Mm -hmm. And yet here we are saying, you need to do this, you need to do that, you need to act in this particular way, right? So during this particular phase of development, um, understanding who we are actually anchors into our blueprint, which has been already there from five to seven. Um, we all have a blueprint, um, but it, it becomes more complex as you continue absorbing and defining and redefining who you are. And, he actually, and it actually goes into an, an error trial process um, in order for, for us to, for, for the young adolescents to formulate who they are. Now, here we are as adults now. Many of you may have 20, I mean, I'm gonna give a range from 20 to, I don't know, 50. And what happens is that our experiences have been already absorbed, incorporated into our blueprint, and we are in a very particular and unique way. What I'm actually advocating for in this the first um, uh, symposium regarding diversity and multiculturalism, uh, because of course, this is our society nowadays, um, a diversified multicultural society. What I'm advocating for everyone and share with everyone is to begin understanding that my otherness, your otherness is so unique and that you must, as part of your responsibility, not only professional responsibility, um, I shouldn't have say you must. I, I don't like to give absolutist and, and extremist terms. But in order to serve the other the best way possible, not only applying the best practices, you got to understand what's within you. 
why is it that you are helping in a particular way, a particular individual from a particular way in a very different way from others? What moves you to do that? And of course, you know, I, I, will, um, I will have some of my colleagues say, no, I don't do that. The fact is that we do. So what, what is the consequence of not exploring that, that part of yourself, not understanding who you are, especially within the field of, of therapy and counseling? Th thank you, Mr. Sita. Uh, some of the challenges that you may encounter, you can produce microaggressions to your clients. You can actually become biased. Um, and even as a clinician, you know, in, in once you get your full license, you can actually um, misdiagnose mm -hmm. because of your bias. You can produce treatment plans that don't align completely with the client's goals. Um, with you as a human service provider in any of its uh, ramifications of a human service provider, whether it's nursing, whether it's uh, social um, uh, social work or, or even substance abuse, think about it. Imagine that you hold bias towards individuals with the substance abuse experiences because you heard that they are violent. Of course, when they come and say, can you help me? thinking about a case management uh, kind of a task, when they come to you and say, can you help me to complete my food stamp supplication? When you hold biases towards particular groups, what you ended up doing is actually either doing it wrong or ignoring it completely. So part of understanding who we are is not that we come to us and, and, and penalize ourselves for, for doing what we do. Quite the contrary. Um, what I always advocate and in, 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 in support in our human service field is to be aware of where is this coming from? How is it that I'm paralyzing myself with a particular group? Or how is it that I'm not paralyzing myself in a particular group? So and it isn't necessarily to change or modify who you are, but the awareness provides you objectivity. Great, great observation. If you ask me in an idealistic world um, and in my worldview, what mobilizes the change is the awareness. So the hope is, and with all my heart, is that once you become aware that you choose to do what's right. Because remember that we all are in the human service field um, and therefore there are actually code of ethics that we need to follow. Right? And one of them is to respect the autonomy of the individual for decision making in anything related to him, her, or they. And even more, the universal contract that we hold with other people to always do good to them. Benevolence, we got to be benevolent to them. This is our feel, right? And any of its ramification, whether it's nursing, teaching, even when, th when we think about lawyers, I always consider them to be also part of the human service because truly, it, and as an umbrella, all of us are serving the population, right? Of, of, of your community. Yeah, and that term benevolent, really, it, it is <clears throat> at the heart of the matter because it isn't just to say, do, do no harm. To be benevolent is to do good on purpose, um, not just to in the, the absence of harm, you know, that's the least that we can do. But as um, as providers, we want to to do good. Um, and that isn't always true because we're in competition with all these other things, you know, business rules, ethical rules, um, policies and procedures in a given agency, your own physical constraints, because you can only do so many things in one day. So there's <clears throat> there's a there's a competition for how you express that um, that care. And, and, and once again, part of the invitation is not for us to judge ourselves because truly, if we do that, we are gonna utilize more energy. The entire purpose is for us to become aware. What is happening within me? Am I, am I actually creating more hurt to people or is it that I'm serving and helping them? So whatever decision you make, even if you say, well, I'm just going to continue feeling this way. Even if you do that, I profoundly believe that you have already acquired a certain level of awareness that will continue to mobilize you to think more and reflect more. So going back to the term otherness as a noun, as an individual, thought, ideas, 
and if I dare myself to be very romantic in terms of how I see the world, it's actually also your soul, what's within you, what moves you, what's the fuel of your daily motivation. So your otherness is constituted not only by everything that you have inherited from family, friends, teachers, even thinking of, you know, the other day I was just thinking how powerful the words of the teacher in early age can be. You call someone, to, um, I'm going to excuse my language, you call, some, you call someone stupid and they go in their life believing it. So that formulates a part of who you are. It creates a limit, an internal limitation. So imagine how powerful it will be for you to go back and begin reflecting. Why is it that it's, this is happening to me? Why is it that I'm responding in a particular way to a particular experience or even more? Um, why do I treat people from this specific group, from this specific socioeconomical status in this specific way? What's part of me that is doing that? Of course, you know, when we think about ethically, we are always called to do the best we can um, and not to hurt people, for sure. Any questions about the term? Yes, yeah, so there are a few comments here, and I'll just speak uh -huh. to you so you can respond to them. Um, uh, Madison posed a question, to be aware of worldly values, other cultures and beliefs, we are aware of others, of us, and those around us. Mm -hmm. More of a statement, but I think she's getting it. <laughs> Beautiful. That's the idea. So what do we have when we begin understanding who we are, everything that we carry with us, and plus we interact with others? We create a mutual us when we engage in a therapeutic or even service provision process with any individual. This us is no longer just I will do you because I'm the authority with the knowledge. This process then becomes we are modifying each other in the moment that we are interacting. Yeah. As a matter of fact, if you think about it, you and I are interacting in this moment. Your comments provide ideas. My words provide particular responses internally or even thought. Even if you are multitasking at this moment, there will be keywords that will link to you when you hear them. And even I'm gonna even go further. Even my accent, my my accent can actually be think thought producing, thinking, oh my God, maybe you are thinking, where is he from? Right? So the idea of even uh, um subtle um occurrences or uh, or phenomena that may happen in any given interaction with people can indeed impact who you are even if you say no it's not doing anything to me indeed it's doing something to you what happens is that we are not accustomed to notice it we are co constantly rushing and running through that our entire ability to be focused goes away and, and, and having this um developing this function is 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 really key to helping other people because you won't be able to analyze them to to recognize what's happening if you're just listening to the story because the story um while there's there's a there's a context there's a subtext to it and they're telling you another story below that and if you're not able to be aware of where they're going and why they're going then you'll get just as confused as they are and, and might think well i don't know how to help this person um but it's important well you you're trying to maintain your objectivity but also maintaining that essence of, of who you are without getting that confused with the other person, so to say. So, so this interaction, everyone, that you see there, those two circles is what we call the feel of the interaction or, um, and it's limited through what we call the frontier. Um, exactly what Mr. Sida said, I am a still me, even when I'm interacting with you and I'm actually opening my frontier for for a lack of a better way of putting it, I'm opening my skin. The skin is no longer a barrier. We are interacting in a field of a dynamic where we both influence each other. Uh, so part of understanding who you are has to do with this dynamic. 
has to do with the to, to understand that what is moving inside of you when particular elements, you know, occur in any dynamic with any human being. And this is with anyone, not only with clients, it's your brother, your sister, your professors, you know, um, oftentimes, you know, I, I see how uh, many of you send me an email, for example, and I can only sense uh, what, he, what is behind those words. And imagine, you know, um, that you can be reading something and begin thinking, how is this email impacting you? What is it producing inside, right? Imagine you writing the email to anyone thinking, what would I produce in the other? By, by indeed giving my entire self in those sentences. Because yeah, so and rather being reactive, mm -hmm. you're, you're, you're kind of engaging in introspection, like, wait, wow, this is really, um, like, it just for example, this, this email is really activating, I feel, you know, um, disrespected, anger, whatever the, whatever the emotion is, but then, but rather than going straight to reactive, you, you start to think about why. Mm -hmm. And that thoughtfulness can lead to deeper awareness. Absolutely. And, and like I said at the beginning, my entire hope is that that awareness mobilize your entire self to for a change, if that's in need, indeed something that you would like to do. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you for, for that, Mr. Sita. So my otherness, as I was sharing, it's not only my, individu my individuality that answers the question of who am I? What do I believe in? What is my stand on a specific topic, such as LGBT, ethnicity, political views, religious views, even spirituality? Why do I stand on? Why do I profoundly defend? What is or what are my views on people's well-being? This I, I like putting that one there because um, when we begin serving people, we have a tendency to impose our values. We are quickly telling them what to do because this is what we believe. So if someone, for example, comes and asks for help and you say, well, I cannot help you, but I need to call 911 because of course, and, uh, uh, or paramedics, because they have to come and get you. And then this individual tells you, wait, I don't have insurance and I don't have money. In your mind, you are actually imposing the values because this is the way you see health, the well-being of the individual is extremely important. But for that individual, that is not the key. For that individual is how is how in the world I'm gonna pay the seven hundred dollars right to the hospital. So when when we begin actually thinking the true impact that we do when we begin reflecting, and and thinking how we may be imposing ourselves in others, it truly helps to begin interacting with others. So your individuality of who you are, um, what do you believe? And, and, we, and we will see examples of what is to believe and, 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 and qualities of, of a stand and of a specific topic and all that. Um, your, your individuality or your uniqueness as an individual is indeed influenced by your family. Where is my family coming from? It's my fortune and my, my, my money coming from me or it's inherited. Is that money uh, providing me a positionality in the society? If it's so, what do I believe? What is it important to me? Um, so family also can give us uh, values, meaning I can share with you that in the Mexican family, at least in mind, um, family comes first. The group is first. In other cultures, that may not be the true. And that value has been inherited by me from my family. This is what has been practiced, even in a more profound way. The way you begin loving and caring all for other individuals has to do with the relationship that you hold with the, 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 the figures who care for you, namely mom and dad. You learn how to care and love in a particular way because this is the way you, you were given that love and care. And then you take all that knowledge and apply it to the outside context, um, the here and now, in the field that you are, as a student, with your boyfriend, with your girlfriend, or whoever is in your life because you inherited that. This is what we call a transgenerational transmission of values. It travels generation through generation through generation. 
and he comes from a beautiful work from family um, theory uh, proposed by Bowen, which I'm in love with, by the way. <laughs> um, what what values do we get from there? And also not only that, but um, how do we actually inherited emotions and ways of expressing those emotions? Um, so we are shaped uh, from the very, er very, very early ages in our life, and we continue through our entire life. The challenge as we continue aging is that we become more complex and there are more filters that allow us to sort out what we want to be influenced by or what we don't want to be influenced by. Or quite the contrary as well. You can be a powerful force of influence based on the limited beliefs that you may carry. So you come and tell people this is the way it needs to be done and that there is no other way of being done. It has to be this way. And, and beautifully enough, because of course the universe balance itself, what we have is that when we want to impose ourselves, the universe brings us another human being that says, no, ah, ah, this is not going to go that way. <laughs> so this is the moment when understanding your otherness comes very handy. The simple question of what's happening within me. What part of me is being moved when someone tells me, no, this is not the way we are going to do it? How do I feel? How do I respond to that? What part of me is moved? What is profoundly shaken inside of me, right? Now, family is also influenced by culture. And alternatively, culture also influences individuality because you come from the family, from that culture. So background, histor history, it's with you. Um, Ways of being looked at and ways of you looking at others comes from uh, cultural aspects as well. Um, this also carries the sense of um, the way you were treated in the community can also be impactful in the way you begin enacting particular ways of looking at life. So my otherness as an expression of these tripartita uh, elements of your own that comes handy to create the unique self that you have. And to imagine that that entire um, uh, basket of elements, it's, it's present in every interaction with others. Of course, as you age, it becomes more complex because you have more resources, more knowledge, more words, more lexicon that allows you to argue more. But at the end of the day, what is foundationally present and moving in any one of us are those early recollections of who we are that are reshape as we move forward. Any questions? Let's see. Uh, yeah. uh, what happens if you don't know your family background, thought? Or in other words, what if you don't know anything about your own culture? Great question, Maria. Uh, I always, I always like to go deeper into those type of questions to under, to understand what's stopping you from knowing about your family and your history. Is it because there are no records? Because um, you know you have no idea? Because whatever the case may be. Even in the instance, look at this, even in the instance when individuals have been adopted, we like to think about your immediate adopting family as a source of influence. Who are they? What values do they provide to you? Which ones are you enacting in the present time? So there is always elements that you can learn. It does still require a lot of responsibility and a lot of work to begin understanding who we are. Well, one way to look at culture is something we're born into. So you might say, okay, well, I have adopted parents, but you are born into a culture form. You are born into a society. So even if I was adopted by, let's say I was, didn't have parents and I ended up in a Japanese orphanage and some Japanese people <laughs> adopted me, I would I would be born to that culture form and it would shape me. Of course, I would have my own historical uh, genetic expression of maybe temperament, 
um, underst cultural understandings of something, you know, ancestral, which I, I believe is there, even though we lack a lot of ways to measure that. But we see it all the time in transgenerational trauma. And it's not just trauma that's transmitted. There's, there's other things, values and attitudes. We know this from when animals or even human beings react to certain uh, natural forms like snakes or I don't know, sharks or something. There's an instinctive reaction to these things. You know, I don't think snakes react to snakes the same way other other animals do because they have a different experience right they're they are the snake they are the predator where they can be mm -hmm. so um i think if there's a question about who am i in terms of culture or who i am i um in terms of you know um heritage if you don't if you have a question there explore it <clears throat> and and then you get and the beautiful thing is that humans are the Things that don't have to maintain their form, we can transform ourselves into whatever we like. Uh, and and um, Maria, just to follow up with your comments, um, I do notice that this particular topic appears to be connecting with you uh, uh, in 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 a quite different way. So this is very important, and 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 I would like to recognize that to you because this is how we start actually learning. What, what is about this topic that makes me ask this question? Or even when you say, I don't feel like, well, it would be great to explore what's stopping you, right? Not, not here, but in your in your own time, what's stopping me? What will happen if I learn more? Well, would, would something change within me? Or would I open up my door to understand more? What will happen? It goes back hand in hand with the idea of openness and willingness. Uh, not often, it's an easy process, but it will pay off as you continue exploring more and more. Beautiful. Thank you, everyone. Mm, you're welcome, Maria. Um, so when we understand my otherness and its importance, so what's going on with the relationship uh, in a therapeutic setting? Even if you are um, a clinical case manager, or if you are just providing psychoeducational uh, work, or if you just work as a, as, a, as a teacher assistant, whatever the work, or if you are in your service in the hospitals providing uh, nursing work right now, uh, what's going on We know in me and what I do for the others, the importance of your otherness in the uh, relationship with others. And I don't know if you have actually investigated this before, I don't see a reason why you needed it to do that, but I, I, I just love philosophy and I spend a lot of time thinking about things that I just like. <laughs> so uh, when we think of our relationality and, and this idea that I am because the other is, this is not something that I came up with. Okay, this is actually a, an African American, African American, an African uh, proverb that is practiced in the communities of Africa. I am because I, you are, obutun, simple obutun. I am because you are. And this reminds me of the concept of Martin Buber, the I thou. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, bar from. The African culture, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Most likely, right? Yeah. Uh -huh. So yeah. imagine when we begin connecting at that level. You are listening because I'm speaking. I am reading your comments because you are manifesting yourself. And still yet, we both interact in a way that is unimaginable. I don't want to go into this quantum language and its power because, of course, that's a different topic. But we indeed interact in ways where we can only coexist at the end of the day. There is no other way of doing it. So I just wanted to share that beautiful quote with everyone. So self-awareness, what is it? We often actually talk about self-awareness, but I love how clinicians and and um and, and professionals, they always say self-awareness, but what in the world is self-awareness, right? So I enlisted a few questions there that kicks in into the elements that are very specific for each of us. How do I see myself? What we call the concept of self-image, right? Who I, who I am? Um, look, I'm, I'm Dr. Wenz. 
well, what if I remove the title? Who are you? Well, I'm just uh, Gerardo. And if he, who else is Gerardo? Well, I'm the son of Maria and Antonio, my parents. And who else? I'm also a colleague of Oscar. Ah, we begin formulating multiple relationships from one relationship. What needs do I have? What do you need at this moment? Even when you are listening to me, are you tired? Are you paying attention? Are you distracted? Are you driving back home because it was a horrible day at work? Are you on the screen uh, listening to, uh, uh, to the concept of awareness? This is the, you always need to be asking yourself, what do I need in this precise moment? Not tomorrow. Well, right now I just need to get water. Okay. That's your awareness. And look, very physiological awareness. I'm thirsty. I'm going to get water. What values do I possess? And uh, mm -hmm. indeed, self-awareness, if anything, if, if you go into your path to become a clinician, this will be a key element to always utilize. Are you aware? Are you aware? So what values do I possess? Values um, respond to a very simple question. And I'm going to give you the key question so that you don't have to pay for a training for that. <laughs> what is important to you in relation to a person, in relation to um, an event, in relation to your employer, in relation to your professors, in relation to your friends, for example. What is important to me um, in relation to my students? Well, what is important to me is to continue offering my students a different way of looking at the human experience. So sharing a new way of looking at life, a value that I have. Do I go and impose it in you? Well, I have to share with you because you have to come to this <laughs> uh, symposium. I may be doing that, <laughs> but um, I always am very careful in understanding what's happening. So how do I feel? What are my emotions? What emotions do I experience? What is it that I'm feeling right now? Uh, what is manifesting in my body? Do I feel anything actually going deeper? Yeah, I'm angry. Yeah, I don't like what you're saying. Or, ah, oh, that makes complete sense. I'm understanding. I feel comfortable. Ah, good. Absolutely. Absolutely. How do I see? How do I see me and see others? Observation, descriptions, examples, facts. How do I see them? The way of looking. What do you like? What do you dislike? What part of my background is present when I like or I dislike? Or when I begin looking at other people with a pair of glasses that are unique to me? What is in my past impacting my present that can actually create a future view? And to imagine the self-awareness is just a war. And it contains so much to it. Right? Any questions? Any other thought, Mr. Sita, for self-awareness? Um, no, I think it's pretty well covered. Um, I, I do want to make a comment on how how important um having this lesson early in your career is because it it formulates your professional identity and how you present yourself and how you regard your clients. Um, I think this is something that while we covered it in, you know, in our K prep programs and our, our graduate programs, it isn't gone into to the in-depth uh, degree, you know, the kind of profound <clears throat> perspective that you're bringing um, to form, which I think is really important. So you might never get this again, just I mean, no matter how far you go, even if into your PhD program, say, I hope you all see the value and um, <clears throat> Dr. Wentz bringing this, um, you know, to, to, to the limelight. 
and and I guess I do it because I wished I would have gotten it explained and and the glows and the construct in this way. <laughs> yeah, right. I agree. I mean, I I'm I'm seeing that too. Like we were left to figure this out ourselves in a way. You know, um, it it was it was kind of glossed over, and then we started to realize, well, this is really important when you get into the field. And then you know, it's almost like a mismatch that where you've got to learn something that you should have learned before when you're in the field. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. So, as a way of providing you a panoramic picture of everything, the how of to get to know who I am. Look, I inverted now the sequence. Because they are, I am. And of course, this goes back directly to the idea that I heard everything. I learned everything, every, every single meta program inside of you. It's being created by others. It's been given to you. So family, we talk about our society, community. This is what we call micro and micro systems influencing you. Now, your, 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 your responsibility and the a high level of responsibility in, 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 in terms of of understanding you is developing your awareness. Do I carry bias? Who do I don't like to work with? Or who do I hate? Why do I hate these people? Or why do I like this person? Or why do I don't like this person? Your values, what's important in the relationship, your beliefs, we will see the, them in a minute, your worldview, you, you probably have positions about what's happening or what will happen in society. And those, that way of looking at life is indeed a, in direct connection with everything else that you have been influenced by. Even your spiritual beliefs, it's inherited. Of course, as I mentioned, as we continue aging, our capacity to, com to think complexly com in a complex manner begins kicking in. So we actually redefine and oftentimes reshape uh, who we are constantly. As a matter of fact, your self-awareness is a forever going process. It's not something that you start today and then tomorrow is like, I'm ready. I know who I am. It's an ongoing process and it will take you your entire life if you so, you, you so wish to. Okay. So here we go. Beliefs. What are beliefs? Right? Is the trust, is the confidence, is the faith is the acceptance of something given to you without any questions. For example, love is good. Who, what do you think about this statement? Love is good. Believes, right? Is it? Is it truly? Is, is it? <laughs> it? Might depend on your relationship status. Mm -hmm. <laughs> How about this belief? Who who probably practices beliefs the most? You should help others. <laughs> we do it right in, in our entire program is the idea of helping. It's there. Uh -huh. So that belief guides part of what we do. Because if we wouldn't believe in helping others, guess what? We wouldn't be here. <laughs> or you would not even be here because this will not be the feel. Right? Giving is better than receiving. I love that one because in, in its very nature, it imposes a limitation. Giving is better than receiving. If I give myself completely, it will be better than receiving. But guess what? Um, unless you are a Buddha or Jesus Christ or any other of the illuminated individuals in this uh, history of the planet, then of course we have expectations. <laughs> so the idea of giving is better than receiving appears to impose this of, go ahead, give yourself without control. Just continue, right? Um, you should go to school. I like putting that there because oftentimes, um, especially when I work as a school counselor, um, this is what we are training young minds to think. You need to go to school in order to be successful, in order to have a good job. But guess what? I have students that are driving those heavy machineries in construction. They make like 20,000 more times of what I do. <laughs> so it's a belief that we support in the society. And why is it important that we notice it? 
because we give it for granted that it is true. So I trust it. So I confine my entire ability to understand that based on those beliefs. And therefore, I accept them as they are. I don't question them, right? Any questions? Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So values, beliefs of what is important to you in a specific situation, context, domain, or even place. What is important to you uh, um, as an individual in the relationship, I don't know, for a daisiness, I will say your boyfriend or girlfriend or your partner. Well, I like my partner to be uh, 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 generous. That's important to you, so that's a value. Or I like my partner to want to have kids, so family is a value I have. Good. I like uh, 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 um, uh, my friend to be healthy. Well-being is a value in that relation, relationship with friends. So value is response to the question of what is important to you for a specific context, domain, issue, place, or individual. So if you ever, ever, ever in your life want to elicit your values, ask yourself, what is important to me and Dr. Wentz? What's important to me in his class? Well, I like him actually to grade uh, better than what he does, to provide me a higher grade. Good. That's your value, that you're looking for kindness from my part. <laughs> so why is it important? So that you understand what you value. And why would that matter in the relationship with the other? So that you understand that maybe you may be imposing your value and not listening to the other. Just saying. <laughs> so biased. Bias is actually a prejudice in favor or against one thing, person, or group. For example, women are weak. That's biased. Latinos are problematic. That's biased. Substance abuse users are dangerous. Very biased. <laughs> so bias is this idea of I'm in favor of or I'm against. Why? Well, it really doesn't matter. It's just I have inherited. I learned that. Society, family, community, everyone surrounds me. This is what they believe. Therefore, this is what I practice. I, th I think it's also insidious because it's it's communicated in a way that isn't necessarily direct. They, they don't they'll it's implied in lots of different ways by people's behaviors, attitudes um, towards whatever bias. Um, and so we almost are programmed in this way unconsciously. You know, um, as, as we're being brought up as children, we're told stories, we're told, um, we, we, we perceive the attitudes based upon, uh, you know, the older folks' uh, attitudes um, and the way they regard people or things. Uh, I did want to address this comment from Madison where she says, I feel like, Sometimes they say, I feel like sometimes trying to find the ultimate unbiased perspective towards everything will eventually come to block it in one way or another. And it's kind of scary to accidentally have this biased perspective with no true understanding of how to overcome it. So when I read that, I, I think maybe a relaxed attitude of curiosity towards the other is the best way to help you understand. Uh, when I travel to different places, especially different countries, different cultures, you can you start to see your own bias as an American because we're in the ambience of the American culture, the American experience. And we start to see, oh, they do things different here. Oh, that seems pretty, works out pretty well. Um, and or just interacting with with people on the street or in cafes or restaurants, whatever you go. Um, so I think curiosity and also just um, allowing yourself to, to be immersed in different experiences that can really help um, explore that without without trying to having to feel guilty about it. I don't think that's the point of it. Um, anyway, I just wanted to make that comment. Please or um, just to add on Madison, um, unconscious or conscious bias are not excusable. 
So part of your responsibility, this is our ethics in our field, part mm -hmm. of our responsibilities is for us to continue growing, to understand what is actually kicking in so that we can reflect on it. Nor it is my intention to say, well, that, that, you did it wrong. No, this presentation is an invitation for us to continuously engage into understanding what can I do? Is this perspective that I'm offering the only one? And if you're not, and I get mad about it, what is that about? So uh, I was just pointing to Mr. Sita's comment, curiosity, not only with the relationship with others, with yourself as well. What's happening there? What it is not excusable though, and I want to make sure this is very clear, conscious or unconscious biased, if you are in the human service field, it is your responsibility to continue exploring yourself. And another way of, of exploring is continue attending presentations, consulting with your supervisor, sharing your thoughts with your supervisor, with your colleagues, continue educating yourself about the cultures or any specific kind of a, you know, challenges that you may encounter. Focus on that. The entire goal is for you to be healthy, joyful, and happy, understanding that we are always working to build out a better self constantly. Mm -hmm. So it's not that I want you to leave this session saying you can do it. Yes, you can do it, but it's going to take work. And we all, um, I mean, look, I still, there are times in which I find myself is still thinking, having thoughts <laughs> that, that, that I know I have worked before on and they come back. So it's always an ongoing process, Madison. Thank you for that. So uh, let me quickly go that. Um, there is a beautiful term now in our society. It has been there for a while, actually from 1994. I don't remember. When was the, uh, Butler's uh, book written, Mr. C. I remember the um, uh, Judith Butler. Um, I think it was in 1994. Well, ever since Jud, uh, Judith Butler began saying that gender is a performance of a society, uh, a behavior in the society, meaning it's culturally constructed, then all the, in the, all the, all the theorists in the field of queer theory, feminist theory, begin, and, begin looking into intersectionality. And, and I think it's very important for us to begin um, exploring that idea of intersectionality because it is part of getting to know who you are. So your sexual identity, your race, your religion, your disability, your classism, your traumas, your relationship status, all come together to formulate a specific identity of yours. Once again, the goal is not to be accusatory or to punish yourself, it's the awareness that truly matters so that we can continue offering the best services possible to others, okay? 1989, sorry, I was... I was 19... little... Thank you. Thank you. I was a little late getting here. <laughs> no, no worries. No worries. So I, I did want to throw that top at a term there because it's part of your otherness as well. Okay. Uh, what would it matter to know myself? Very simple. I hope this picture answers everything. Because in any instant in our life, we are always in touch with others. We are interacting. So my beliefs, my values, my bias, my intersectionality comes to close to the other's beliefs, bias, belief, intersectionality. To formulate what? To formulate an us. So we can coexist. Um, yes, indeed, as you continue in this field, you will become the counselor and you will become the individual with knowledge and information. But that actually increases the level of responsibilities to help the other to actually understand that part as well. So that whenever you are co-creating with the individual, he, they, she can learn and you can learn even more about you. There is always uh, an opportunity to learn about others. So in serving others, this is just a few thoughts that I wanna share with you. In serving others, review your own identity. Check your thoughts, check your beliefs, check your values, check your intersectionality. And of course, avoid imposing on others anything. 
Remember. Just remember this. Serving others is about them, not about you. Although you can be very well touched through the interaction. Okie dokie. Um, any questions? Comments? No questions, no comments. Let me go back so I can see everyone. Thank you, Dr. Wentz. What a, what a fascinating topic that has no 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 end to the depths that you can go to because um, it just touches on so many things that we might take for granted in our in everyday living. And so, so shining a light on this can really just help us to be more <clears throat> conscious and aware of how we experience things. And I think a positive um aspect of, of that is that um, we grow at a more expansive way rather than just in a, in a narrow, a narrow, narrow field within the same uh, kind of area of knowledge and understanding. Um, it really makes you question a lot of things. And, and that's, that's good, especially for a group of students. It's curious, it's learning. It's also um, interested in serving others because it's not going to just be the changes now. Every day, something new will emerge within a social system, and that's healthy. Uh, when systems don't change, and you remember this from sociology, they become stagnant and static, and they die. Um, so at, if a system is evolving, while well, you know, sometimes it's painful and difficult for us to accept. The older I get, I, the more I realize it. Um, <laughs> but what was what was novel and new for my generation when I was growing up was painful for, for my parents. And I'm sure the same thing happened to them. So there's perspective of time and generation uh, help you to be a little bit more gentle and understanding. Um, and also, if, if, if you have that kind of attitude of, of flexibility and adaptability, it, it doesn't be a, it's not a bother. It's just a it's just a further flowering of the human experience. And I, and I think it's just beautiful. Um, so thank you for, for in, providing us with some insight into that topic. And I'm sure. Um, and I just, I just want to take a moment of marketing right here. Next symposium is understanding the other. So this gets complex and complex until we, we build up to begin understanding that the relationship is extremely powerful. So just so you know, it will continue. <laughs> yeah, when, when Dr. Wentz and I are planning out the curriculum and make changes and we adopt new texts, we often get into these really extreme, uh, uh, you know, esoteric conversations about what's, <laughs> what's important. We, you know, take hours and hours. But the, the, the goal is to really give you the best education possible within the given time that we have you. And we do often talk about things that we're missed in our own um uh, academic programs, you know, that we thought in this higher level of study, these things should have been introduced earlier on rather than later on. And so when you see these topics emerge um, and are available to you for, for your academic consumption, I hope you realize that we, we put a lot of thought into this because we really want you guys to be well prepared um, and to, to be able to critically think about these ideas and then, you know, add to your body of knowledge so you're able to kind of incorporate that into your, your daily practice and your, your, your ethics as they develop and change. And they will because it's just inevitable. Beautiful. So, everyone, the key word that you need to submit for your assignment is Phoenix, Phoenix, Phoenix. So, yeah, you'll, you'll want to put that keyword um, in your assignment for credit for um for attending the symposium today yeah that, that's we will continue and, developing more and we will continue engaging in these discussions more yeah, you pull it in three times phoenix 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 we say it three times so see you remember yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> and of course, um, af after, if you talk to us, folks who weren't able to come tonight in class, um, we'll upload this by the end of the week into YouTube and we'll add the link into that assignment. That way you can go back and watch it again if you want to, or the folks who weren't able to come that may be working or, 
you know, have other um, responsibilities at this time, they can still participate. And if you miss it next time, then, you, you know, there's an alternative because we really want to be inclusive of having everybody be able to participate in some way or shape or form. I know it's not always um, conducive to show up a specific time. I know we have folks in different time zones and, you know, in different lifestyles and things like that. So they might have to, to or look after kids or loved ones and then not be able to make it this time. So really do appreciate your time and being here and all the hard work you're putting into the semester. I hope you realize that when we challenge you, it isn't out of uh, spite or, or malice. We really know that in order for you to grow, we have to create um, a robust academic environment that challenges you. And, and I hope that comes across, comes through how we're doing it without um, frustrating you. I mean, the point is to frustrate the system. So it <laughs> helps. Um, and we, we know how to do it. We understand um, how folks face challenges and grow up beyond them really strengthens their resolve and their attitude towards themselves and towards others. And then having kind of a positive interaction with that growth process. So, okay. okay. Well, thank you everyone. Nice. Have a great night. Just very quickly, if you attended and you put the keyword in the assignment in Canvas, then you are cool. No need for summary. Only those that did not attend need to rewatch and provide a two page summary of the presentation. Okie dokie, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your night. Practice self care and we will be in touch. Take care. Good night.